The Modern Salon, curated by Laura Cantrell. The French salons of the 18th and 19th centuries were a significant part of art and culture. They provided a place for living artists to exhibit their work annually or semi-annually, and thus a place to promote their work with aspirations of finding financial support for their art careers. The first Royal French Academy Salon was held at the Louvre in 1648, and after 100 years it moved to the Salon Carré, where the paintings had few inches between them and sculptures had little walking room around them as well. Though to the modern curator this seems overwhelming to the viewer, it is important to remember that this was a bit of a competition for artists, so if an artwork could be so noteworthy in such an exorbitant amount of work, it meant something. My idea for this particular exhibition is to do what the academic salons did, but with a modern twist. What is the same is that this show will pack many great living artists' work into one space, showcasing their most recent works. What is different is the new mediums in architecturally modern spaces where the work will be shown. The space I envision is not much different than the typical modern art museum. Light walls and light hardwood floors with bursts of naturally bright light through the industrial painted beams at the ceiling. However, at the beginning of the show, there will be a visual nod to the days of old. The first room will contrast from the rest of the show as it will be painted in a rich, dark, neutral chateau brown with rich oak floors. This room is like the warp zone into the future, as the first painting viewers will see on an interior wall is Jeff Koons' gazing ball, Turner Ancient Rome. I chose to enter with this Jeff Koons piece because at 61 years old, Jeff Koons has been around the contemporary art world for a while, and he's a name that people would expect to see. Um, with this particular piece, though, I think it's an interesting nod to the salon, and it reminds us that the salon um, didn't always just show some of the great rule followers, but it also showed some of the most revolutionary artists, such as J.M.W. Turner. Turning the corner, you would enter into the painting gallery which would be a little bit more spaced out than the original salon um, to make it more modern. However, I would expect that there would be some, um, some focus on this particular piece by the young artist Titus Kafar, and he was actually recognized in Time Magazine for it in 2014 in the Man of the Year edition, and it captures the Ferguson protests as it's titled, Yet Another Fight for Remembrance. Moving into the drawing and printmaking gallery, we would see um, this piece by Tracy Emin from 2015 entitled, I Think of You All the Time. And the title is very characteristic of the way that Tracy Emin works from a very personal um, narrative. If you think back to her earliest works in the 80s and 90s, where she used multimedia, I'm sorry, mixed media to um, discuss very personal um, life issues. And moving into the future now, we see evidence of her um, connection to drawing. She's a professor of drawing at the Royal Academy of Arts in London. And so I think it is interesting that she has a connection to a Royal Academy. And here I would be showing her work in this salon type exhibit. Kiki Smith is one artist I would not want to ignore in this year's exhibition, um, as she's recently been um, recognized for Lifetime Achievement Awards. And um, that's just to add on to a long list of awards she's already received. Lately, she's been working primarily in printmaking, mostly etching. And here you would, um, we would see a collection of her most recent polymer prints. As sort of a climax in the middle of the entire exhibition, I would have a series of smaller rooms that showcase il um, installation artists. And this is, of course, a, um, a relatively new art form that wouldn't have existed in the 19th century salons. So I think this is a really exciting part. And I would showcase um, both some of the original installation artists I think of who have made installation art a very viable art form, such as Kara Walker, like we see here. And then I would also contrast that with relatively new artists here, like um, Marguerite Humo. And at the beginning of her exhibition, the viewer would read that the walls are 
have been covered with two grams of deadly black mamba venom. And the viewer would then be instructed to stay away from the walls and protect the shoes, their shoes when entering the exhibition space, which is exciting and new. Um, she combines a lot of new materials, such as um, breast milk that she even bought on www.onlythebreast.com. Moving into the sculpture galleries, I wouldn't be surprised if this particular artist, Kehinde Wiley, would be turning heads, um, especially because he's mostly well known as a painter. Um, he typically is well known for pieces that blend street culture with um, classical art. And in this particular piece, we, we see that, but with, uh, with, with bronze. And I think this is a sort of a, a neat turning point in his very young career. I'm sure a lot of people ask themselves, just as I do, after For the Love of God, what will um, Damien Hirst do next? I mean, For the Love of God, what will he do? And this would be a really exciting piece to have right at the end of the show, where Damien Hirst sort of outdoes himself again as the Grim Reaper in clown shoes with a gilded skeleton of a three meter tall woolly mammoth. So this would conclude the show on sort of a shocking and very exuberant note, just as the, um, the original salons would have promised as well. So I hope you've enjoyed my virtual tour of my hypothetical um, modern salon, and I look forward to seeing what all the rest of you have suggested as well. Thanks.